<coughs> Money is a very important tool in life, which is why we must study it. And to further understand what it is, we need to understand where it comes from. And to understand where money comes from, we must study the characteristics of sound money. So we will begin this lecture by discussing some of the contributions to the theory of money. We will then discuss a barter economy. From there we will discuss the difference between money proper and money substitutes. We will then discuss the regression theorem, which is a concept that Ludwig von Mises uses to explain the value of money, and we will finish with how money supply affects prices. Now let's get started. Some of the biggest contributions to the Austrian school when it comes to the theory of money are Karl Menger's book, The Origins of Money, published in 1892, Ludwig von Mises's book, The Theory of Money and Credit, which expands on Menger's approach to money with the regression theorem, and another good book comes from Murray Rothbard, What Has the Government Done With Our Money? So all three books are a recommended read. Now the sad truth is that most people don't know what real money is, and they have adopted what's known as the state theory of money. The state theory of money is a theory put forward by a German economist named George Friedrich Knapp, and it is the title of his book which was published in 1905. His theory takes the stance that money must have no intrinsic value, and that money's value should be derived from the issuance of an institutional form of government, rather than spontaneously through relations of exchange. So whatever the government issues as money, the people have no choice but to accept it as legal tender, or they will be punished. The state theory of money is an assault on freedom, which is why the government enforces this theory by issuing money in the form of fiat currency. We have government-issued paper which most people refer to as money, but they are wrong. Fiat currency is not money, it is currency. Money is something that has utility, and currency is a money substitute. So it's important that you understand what real money is, because you will then understand that price inflation has nothing to do with what's going on around the world. A pandemic or war in Europe and the Middle East does not cause inflation. Government spending and a central bank's monetary policy is the source of all inflation. Now, before we move on and discuss a barter economy, let's quickly discuss voluntary exchange. So voluntary exchange happens because both parties expect to benefit. In a barter economy, we exchange goods for goods, and in a monetary economy, we exchange money for goods. And so everyone involved in the act of exchange, whether it's through barter or through a monetary exchange, expects to benefit. If I have something you want, and you have something I want, and we both exchange, then we both benefit. So that leads us into a barter economy, which is exchanging goods for goods. Now there are many different problems inside a barter economy which we will discuss, but one of those problems is divisibility. It's difficult to divide certain goods against other goods. For example, Say you manufacture shoes for a living, and shoes are the only means you have to trade with, so you've got to barter your shoes for all your lively needs. Now let's say you want to barter your shoes for a new car. In a barter economy, the only means a car dealer has to trade with are his cars. Now even if you found a car dealer looking for shoes, he might say that he only needs 20 pairs of shoes to last him for the rest of his life, but the car might be worth 50 pairs of shoes. So, although you may be willing to give him 50 pairs of shoes in exchange for a car, if the car dealer doesn't want the extra 30 pairs of shoes, then you won't be able to trade, and the car dealer probably doesn't want to cut the car in half, nor would you want half a car. So neither the shoes or the car are very divisible. This means that a double coincidence of wants is required to barter goods for goods, meaning you would need to find a car dealer who wants exactly 50 pairs of shoes in exchange for one of his cars. So it would be very difficult to live in a system where we barter goods, and you can see how that would affect economic growth. Now although there may have been a time in human history where a barter economy worked, and although such a system is not entirely impossible, it is very inefficient. So the inefficiency of barter is what led people to start using certain commodities to accommodate trade. It led people to search for a medium of exchange. So let's discuss what kind of commodities are more likely to be accepted as a means to trade with rather than bartering goods. In other words, what are the characteristics of a commodity that we can use as money? Well, we want something that is easily divisible, so we want something that can be divided up into smaller units without losing value, unlike shoes or a car. We want something that's durable, so something that won't deteriorate over time. We want something that has a high value to weight ratio, which implicates the importance of scarcity. And we want something fungible, so one unit of that commodity is the equivalent to any other unit. 
These are the qualities that we look for in a commodity that can be used as a medium of exchange. Then once we find something that fits these criteria and people embrace this commodity, that is when it becomes money. Historically, different goods have served as money. At one point, the Roman Empire paid their soldiers with salt, and actually the word salary derives its meaning from a Roman soldier's monthly allowance paid in salt. Salt wasn't the only thing that was used as money. Seashells, cocoa beans, bread, many different goods at different times in history have served as money. But over time, and for thousands of years now, gold and silver emerged as the best form of money. They replaced all the other commodities and became the number one globally accepted medium of exchange because they meet all the necessary characteristics as a means to trade with. They are divisible, durable, scarce, fungible, and most of all, everyone wants these precious metals. There will always be demand for gold and silver, which gives them value, and one ounce of gold is exactly the same as any other ounce of gold. So no matter where in the world you mine gold or silver, when it's melted down it's all the same, and so that makes precious metals the perfect commodity to utilize as a medium of exchange, both domestically and globally. This leads us into the concept of money proper and money substitutes. These are the two types of money. Money proper is a good that has utility, and utility is what gives it value. So we want something that has value to be the foundation of what a sound monetary system is built on. So let's use gold and silver as the base money because precious metals have served as money for thousands of years, and as we've discussed, their characteristics make them the best form of money compared to other commodities. They satisfy wants, they are scarce, durable, divisible, and fungible. That is what gives precious metals, and in particular gold, a monetary value. It has all the right characteristics of money proper, so gold and silver is what we use as the foundation of a monetary economy. We also have money substitutes which are paper claims to a fixed amount of money proper. Examples of money substitutes are banknotes or a certificate of deposit, so these lay claim to money proper. In the good old days, and we will learn more about this in the lecture on banking, people would take in their banknotes and the bank would give them back money proper, so the bank would swap money substitutes for gold and silver. So what happened to our money, or as Murray Rothbard puts it, what has the government done with our money? But how did we go from trading in gold and silver, which has value, to trading in paper? Why did people go from exchanging valuable goods to worthless pieces of paper? Well, the reason why people started trading with these money substitutes is because carrying around gold and silver is heavy. It's a lot heavier than paper, which makes money substitutes a convenient means to trade with. Another reason is security purposes. If you're carrying around a stack of precious metals, you run the risk of a thief stealing them from you. So because of these inconveniences and for the security of their money proper, people put their gold into private banks and they would use money substitutes as currency. So these money substitutes, which are claims to units of gold stored in private banks, could be used to purchase goods and services. And so instead of going to the bank and getting out gold, then going out and buying everything you need using money proper, for convenience, people started paying with money substitutes. They would sign over the money substitute for an agreed-upon amount of gold in exchange for goods or services, and the receiver of the money substitute now owns the agreed-upon amount of gold or silver. This is a free market economy absence the interference of government. But the government eventually took control of our monetary base, and central banks practically monopolized the banking industry. Money substitutes were replaced with fiat currency, which is backed by the full faith and credit of a corrupt government. For a while, fiat currencies were backed by gold. This was known as the gold standard. A gold standard is a monetary system where each unit of currency is based on a fixed amount of gold, so you could exchange paper for gold at a fixed price. Then, in 1971, US President Richard Nixon announced that the US would no longer exchange their currency for gold that effectively ended the gold standard in the US. Other countries then followed suit, and now we are left with a fiat monetary system. We are left with the money substitutes that are no longer redeemable for gold. All we have are these worthless pieces of paper. But I guess the concept of money proper and money substitutes can still be applied to a fiat system. For example, these government-issued paper bills, well, they could be considered as money proper, and the money substitutes are our debit cards. 
or a money substitute is the digital currency that we transfer between each other online, and we can then redeem digital currency into fiat currency through our debit cards. So you could say that fiat currency is money proper and our debit cards are money substitutes. But although fiat currency is accepted as money, paper's value when it's regressed back to its origins as a commodity, well its intrinsic value is practically worthless, you could probably burn a million dollars in cash and it would barely heat the house for an hour. Fiat currency has no intrinsic value. Sound money such as gold and silver have real value. This example of money proper and money substitutes using fiat currency and our debit cards is a good segue into Ludwig von Mises' regression theorem. The regression theorem explains that the value of money can be traced back to its value as a commodity. Fiat currency, when it's regressed back to its origin as a commodity, is practically worthless. It also lacks some of the characteristics of money. It's not scarce. It's not durable. It doesn't have a high value to weight ratio and it can be easily manipulated. So according to the regression theorem, the true value of money is determined by its origins as a commodity and its ability to function as a medium of exchange. So the theorem argues that money itself must have utility in order to give it value. That's why gold serves as the best form of money. So then let's talk about gold's utility as a commodity. What gives this yellow metal value before it is used as money? So the question is, does gold have a non-monetary value before it has a monetary value? Well, as we know, gold is predominantly used to make high-end jewellery. It's a luxury good and a symbol of wealth, and so people like to wear it because it makes them feel good. It is also used for decoration purposes. Wealthy people use it to decorate their houses, and famous artists use gold leaf to paint and frame their work. So the demand for gold due to its utility as a commodity has been there for thousands of years. That is what gives it value. In the modern era, gold has even more utility because of its industrial application. It's in all of our electronic devices. NASA uses gold in their rocket ships and satellites. It is the best conductor of electricity among many other valuable uses, so the value of gold comes from its utility as a commodity before it's used as money, and so real money must have real value. Now let's move on to money supply and how an increase affects prices. When money supply increases, the value of each unit of money decreases because there is more money in circulation chasing the same amount of goods and services. For example, let's say the only two goods available on the planet were two fishing rods and the only money that was available were two $1 coins. Well then, each fishing rod would be priced at $1. Now if the money supply increased to $4, but no more fishing rods were produced, then the price of each fishing rod would increase to $2. So the purchasing power of money decreases with more supply. This is inflation. Inflation is an increase in money supply which affects prices. The more money in circulation causes prices to rise. The government and central bankers want people to believe that inflation is the rate at which prices increase over time. This is a lie that they want you to believe because government institutions such as a central bank is what controls the money supply. Central banks claim to be independent from government, but they are not. Politicians point the finger at capitalism. They put the blame on rich people and entrepreneurs. That's how they win votes. And that's why politicians reject a sound monetary system. Printing money gives the government more control. In contrast, a sound monetary system restricts government control and provides a stable foundation for economic growth. That is why we need sound money, less regulation, and less government. The key takeaways from this lecture. 1. Money's value should be derived from its utility. 2. A barter economy is very inefficient. 3. The regression theorem explains the value of money as a commodity before it's used as a medium of exchange. 4. Inflation is an expansion of money supply and credit.